Good morning, everyone. This next section, session will be talking about the auditor's reporting model, specifically the PCOB issued a week ago today a reproposal on the auditor's report intended to make the auditor's report more relevant and informer, informative to users. This reproposal is hot off the presses. Um, and today, even though we recognize it was only issued a week ago when we're looking, looking for comments um, April, August 15th, um, but even still, the standing advisor group is a, is a very important group to us and very interested in any initial reactions, comments you may have, and happy to answer any questions too. Jessica Watts and I are, are going to spend a few minutes just to kind of provide some background and overview, um, a little bit about the reproposal, but really we're interested in, in hearing from you and answering any questions you may have or providing any, any observations on the changes that have, made, have been made and if you think those changes are good, which we're hoping we'll hear that. But again, I, um, up to you. So um, this project, just for some brief background, um, has been several years in the making. We started this back in 2010, um, and really some of the dis discussions with the standing advisory group were really informative to us in, in the direction of the project and, and looking to make some substantive changes to make the auditor's report more relevant and informative to users. Um, after we conducted a lot of outreach with the SAG, with investors, auditors, preparers, um, and, and many others, the PCOB issued a concept release, held a roundtable, then in 2013 we issued a proposal, in 2014 had a public meeting. We've, there's been much academic research coming out, which we've considered, much of that um, is reflected in the reproposal the board issued. And also we've been seeing changes that have been happening global, globally. So talking about an expanded auditor's report has become a reality around the world. Um, it hasn't happened here in the United States, but we're seeing, we've seen changes go into effect and have been able to study how, how those changes have been. Have investors found the, the changes helpful? Um, what's been the effect of the audit? And, and so far what we've see, been seeing is a lot of positive results. As far as the proposal, as I said, that the objective has been to make the, the report more relevant and informative to users. Um, the audit, of, of course, is, involves a significant effort and auditors spend a significant amount of time in order to issue an opinion on the company's financial statements. The report as it exists today in the United States is a pass-fail opinion. Um, so all this work um, results in, in in a pass-fail opinion, which is very, very important, um, it's whether the company's financial statements are, are fairly presented or not. Um, but nonetheless, investors have asked for more information from the auditor. They view the auditor as an independent third party um, and are interested in hearing kind of really what are the issues that keep the auditor awake at night. Um, and uh, so that's what our reproposal has intended to do. Um, what it does is it would require the auditor to communicate in the auditor's report critical audit matters arising from the audit that required especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment, um, and also how the auditor responded to those matters. We believe that critical audit matters are likely to be identified in areas that investors have indicated would be of particular interest to them such as significant management estimates and judgments made in preparing the financial statements, areas of high financial statement and audit risk, unusual transactions, and other significant changes in the financial statements. The reproposed standard also includes additional improvements that are primarily intended to, to clarify the auditor's role and responsibilities related to the audit and to make the report easier to read. Um, before I turn it over to Jessica, I'd just like to spend a couple minutes on initiatives of other regulators and, and standard setters. The IAASB, the European Union, and the Financial Reporting Council in the UK have all adopted requirements for expanded auditor reporting that go beyond the pass-fail opinion. While their underlying requirements differ in the details, there is a common theme in these initiatives, communicating information about audit-specific matters in the auditor's report. We, of course, recognize that the regulatory market environments in other jurisdictions are different from the United States. But even so, we carefully consider the efforts undertaken in these different jurisdictions, and we think the, our reproposal is analogous in many respects to the, to the requirements recently established in other jurisdictions. 
We've also been monitoring quite carefully the experience in the UK at our 2014 public meeting. We had several representatives from the UK talking about their experience, how are things going, are investors finding this valuable, how are auditors um, adapting to these new requirements, have they been able to issue their report timely. Um, the FRC, so that's the um, analogous to the PCOB in the UK, the financial reporting, um, they're the audit regulator in the UK. They have published um, a couple of reports regarding implementation after year, year one and most, most recently year two. And, and they have noted that investors greatly value the information provided in expanded auditor reporting. And over, overall, we find the experience in the UK, um, and there's the, I know a couple of SAG members from the UK, they may want to talk about their experience as well. But we're finding their experience quite encouraging, and we're hopeful that the changes to the report, um, if adopted by the PCOB, would be well received here. So with that as an overview, I'll turn it over to Jessica just to walk through the, the requirements. And, and again, we're happy, really interested in hearing your comments today. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Good morning. So we are, as Jen has said, we are most interested in hearing from you, so I'm going to only spend a few minutes on the key aspects of the reproposal and some differences from the proposal. Um, as Marty did earlier, please feel free to ask questions throughout and just put your tent card up and we will um, stop and call on you. Um, as Marty mentioned, and Jen, last Wednesday the board issued the reproposal for public comment and our comment period ends on August 15th. Um, I plan to describe a few key aspects of the reproposal, including the requirements related to critical audit matters and key changes to these requirements from 2013 proposal, and briefly describe some additional improvements to the auditor's report, including clarifications of the ex existing auditor responsibilities, disclosure of the auditor tenure, and some standardization of the auditor's report. Most significantly, the reproposed standard would require communication of the auditor's report of any critical audit matters arising from the audit of the current period's financial statements. While the concept of critical audit matters has been carried forward from the 2013 proposal, the definition has been modified in a number of respects. Under the reproposal, the critical audit matters would be defined as any matter that was communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee and that relates to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements and involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. The source of critical audit matters has been narrowed to matters communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee um, from the matters um, in the 2013 proposal, which were documented in the engagement completion document, reviewed by the engagement caller reviewer, or communicated to the audit committee. The reproposed standard also adds a materiality component to the definition of a critical audit matter because some commenters were concerned that the auditor otherwise may be required to communicate information that management is not required to disclose. By using relates to, the critical audit matter could be an element of an account or disclosure and does not necessarily need to be the entire account or disclosure or could be a matter that has a pervasive effect on the financial statements. Criteria by which to determine a matter as a critical audit matter was also narrowed from the 2013 proposal, which used the criteria of involve the most difficult subjective or complex auditor judgments, pose the most difficulty to the auditor in obtaining sufficient appropriate audit evidence, or pose the most difficulty to the auditor in forming an opinion on the financial statements. It was narrowed to those matters that involved especially challenging subjective or complex auditor judgment. This change reflects some commenters' concerns that the original definition could lead to the reporting of unimportant matters or to misinterpretation by financial statement users that the auditor is uncomfortable with the related accounting or disclosures. Under the reproposed standard, once the auditor identifies a matter communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee that relates to accounts and disclosures that are material, the auditor would then uh, take into account a series of non-exclusive list of factors when determining whether a matter involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgments. The list of factors in the reproposal is similar to those in the proposal, but has been modified. The reproposed standard includes six factors to assist the auditor in determining critical audit matters. Determination should be made in the context of the particular audit, 
with the aim of providing audit specific information rather than a discussion of generic risks. The reproposed factors provide a principles based framework for the auditor to use in assessing whether a matter involved especially challenging, subjective, or complex auditor judgment. Depending on the matter, the auditor's determination that a matter is a critical audit matter might be based on only one factor, a combination of factors, or other factors specific to the audit that were not in the list that we have provided. The communication of a critical matter in the auditor's report would include identifying the critical audit matter, describing the principal considerations that led the auditor to determine that the matter is a critical audit matter, describing how it was addressed in the audit, and referring to the relevant financial statement accounts and disclosures. These are similar to the communication requirements of the proposal. However, in response to commenter suggestions, the new requirement for the auditor to describe how the critical audit matter was addressed in the audit was added. To meet this requirement, the auditor may describe the auditor's response or approach that was most relevant to the matter, a brief overview of procedures performed, and an indication of the outcome of the auditor's procedures or key observations with respect to the matter. Many commenters also stated that the communication of critical audit matters in areas where the company has no current reporting obligation would result in the auditor being the source of original information, that is, disclosing confidential information about the company or effectively imposing a lower disclosure threshold than current management reporting requirements. The reproposal includes a note that indicates that when describing critical audit matters in the auditor's report, the auditor is not expected to provide information about the company that the company has not made publicly available unless such information is necessary to describe the principal considerations that led the auditor to determine the matter is a critical audit matter or describe how the matter was addressed in the audit. Additionally, if the auditor determines there are no critical audit matters, the auditor would also state that in the, the auditor's report. Under the reproposal, auditors would be required to document whether matters that were communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee and that related to accounts and disclosures that are material to the financial statements were critical audit matters. This documentation requirement has been narrowed from the 2013 proposal which would have required documentation of, for matters that appeared to meet the definition of a critical audit matter, but were not reported. Several commenters expressed concern that the documentation requirement for non-reported matters was broad and not aligned with current audit documentation requirements. The amount of documentation required would vary with the circumstances and the auditor could comply with the documentation in a variety of ways. Under the 2013 proposal, the standard would have applied to all audits conducted under PCOB standards. However, the re-proposal contemplates that the communication of critical audit matters would not be required for audits of brokers and dealers, benefit plans, or investment companies other than business development companies. Overall, the board considered that the communication of critical audit matters for these types of entities may not provide meaningful information about this in the same way as that for other issuers. However, auditors of these entities would not be precluded from including critical audit matters in the auditor's report voluntarily. So the next slide provides an overview of the key change to critical audit matters. However, I've already gone through these throughout the other slides, so I'm not going to spend any time here. So um, the re-proposed standard also includes additional improvements to the auditor's report such as clarifications of the existing auditor responsibilities, which would enhance certain standardized language in the auditor's report. As Marty mentioned this morning, um, we would be adding whether due to error or fraud in the, in the auditor's report that has not been there previously, although the auditor has had that responsibility. Um, also another one would be tenure. We're going to add an element to the, that would describe how long the auditor has had a relationship with the company and then a statement on the audit, that the auditor is required to be independent. There is a standardized form of the auditor's report which would require the opinion be the first section of the auditor's report and then um, require section titles for, um, to guide the reader throughout the um, auditor's report. 
With that, I would like to open the floor for discussion, and we are very interested in your thoughts on our new reproposal. You know, so again, anything regarding, oh, you're first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, thank you very much for re-exposing this and pursuing, you know, the extended form audit report. It's something we've had in the UK for, we're now in our third reporting cycle, and investors have been very appreciative of the moves that have been made. Um, and also, thank you very much for the briefing on Friday. I think that was very, very helpful in advance of the meeting. Um, as regards the points I'd like to make about what is proposed, I suppose it comes down to the definition of critical audit matters. Um, one of the key criteria for considering whether or not something is critical is that it's material to the financial statements. However, the PCOB has refrained from going that one step further and requiring the auditors to disclose that materiality. That is something that is required in the UK and it is something that we have very much welcomed. It allows us to sort of set a sort of benchmark as to what is disclosed. We also have a concern that, you know, the FASB, I think, has issued a release and it's actually putting materiality in more of a legislative and judicial context and taking away the issuer's judgment as to what users would find necessarily value. I, I also have a concern that the, the critical audit matters are defined in terms of the context of the matters that are reported to the audit committee. Um, that combined with materiality, we feel there is a risk that it could result in a slew of disclosures which really serve to obscure what, what's going on. Um, we could be swamped by a laundry list. What I think is very important in this is that auditors display their own judgment and, they're, they're, and that they've exercised professional scepticism and possibly addressed management's lateral bias to present more favorable results. Um, the FRC, when it adopted proposals, adopt very much a risk-based approach. We very much welcome this, the risk material misstatement and how the auditor addressed them. And we also particularly welcome the fact that a number of firms voluntarily, they weren't required to do so, went that one step further and actually described what they'd found as a result of those audit procedures. That's, I mean, I very much welcome what you're doing, but I just have some reservations as to how that may play out in the future. Thank you. Liz, I'd just like to um, ask you a follow-up question. You first talked about, I, I thought I heard you say kind of two things regarding materiality, and I just kind of, I don't know if it was two things or one. I know in the UK, the UK audit reports have an additional element that the PCOB reproposal does not. So that is disclosure of the auditor's materiality. Um, we do talk about, um, we didn't have, I think we had one comment letter that came in on that point in our, from our proposal. So we, the, the reproposal acknowledges that, but we're, we don't have, um, we didn't receive interest from that in the U.S. from the 2013 reproposal, the comments that came in. I thought I heard you say an interest in a similar disclosure in the U.K., or were you talking more about just the definition of the critical audit matter component, or kind of both, or I, I just wanted to clarify that okay. point. In terms of determining what is a critical audit matter, I think I had, I had two concerns. A, the dependence on materiality and the fact that that is not disclosed, and B, the fact that it's the matters reported to the audit committee and whether or not that could ultimately result in a laundry list and that it's not actually asking the auditor to stand back and say what in their judgment were critical audit matters and where you know, they saw the risk of material misstatement. Does that, does that clarify it? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. I was wondering, maybe just follow up, um, could you expand a little bit, because as Jennifer said, we didn't get a lot of comment on the disclosure of how the, what the auditor set as the materiality threshold in, in doing the audit. We didn't get a lot of comment here in the U.S. that that would be a valuable input to the audit reporting model here. You said you're finding that useful. Could you expand further in terms of that would be helpful to hear on the record, but how you find that to be useful, how you're using it. Okay. Um, 
In the UK, what we're finding is that auditors are disclosing, first of all, how they determine materiality, whether it was percentage of turnover, pre-tax profit, etc., whether or not they made any adjustments to that, to those figures when they actually determine materiality, and also how materiality, probably quite importantly, had changed, if it had changed from the prior year. Um, this really gives investors a view on how, and how detailed, how the auditor dived into those figures in the company, the extent of their testing, etc. And I think we found it very, exceedingly helpful, particularly because we are now going into a phase in the UK where we're getting more sort of tendering and rotation of audits, um, you know, to see how we can see if that materiality changes as a consequence of that, because we think it's giving us a, a real indication as to the quality of the audit work that's undertaken. Thanks. That's, that's helpful, and uh, I'd be interested to see if that, uh, your experience with that and the usefulness you find with, of that information spurs further comments from uh, others here in, on our proposal uh, about that. So thank you. Arnold? Oh, well, thanks. Um, I think I can speak for the IWASB and not just for myself. Um, that, um, we are really pleased with what you have achieved here. Um, delighted to see the outcome. We are very pleased with the dialogues that we could have with you in between. Um, I recall from the first proposal and the public comments that many noted that there was a lot of similarity between the camps with a C and the camps with a K. Um, I think what we see now is that it has been much more close even, and I think that's in the very best interest of the users of financial statements and auditors' reports. Um, so we congratulate you with these efforts, um, board and staff, and we thank you for the dialogue. Um, what we also intend to do to serve the public understanding is that maybe on Monday we issue a brief press release with some comments about, let's say, how close this is to what we have with the key audit matters in particular as a further complement to what you have done and to serve the many users. Um, early this morning, um, Ken Goldman is now not here, but he made an interesting point about auditors being proud of what they have been doing. And I thought that was exactly what we have been seeing now with the countries where there is already experience with this new style auditor's report. Whether it would be Jimmy Deboe in the UK or Solega Jasper in South Africa that we heard this last week in Paris in a panel that you attended as well. Or Winston Gunn in Singapore or Ron Clark in Australia. All of them express how, how proud they have been on their profession and what they have been able to do, and now they can share it with the audience outside. These are the most complex matters, significant, uh, judgmental, etc. And I think that's in the very best public interest. Um, we have agreed at the IWASB that we will do a post-implementation review of these new audit reporting standards in a couple of years' time, 18 or 19 or so. Um, that certainly will include uh, the topic of materiality. Uh, we have discussed it, of course, at length in the IWASB. We did not want to require disclosure of materiality because we didn't want to, to distract from the focus on relevance for users. So key audit matters or critical audit matters have to be the most relevant communications to, to outside users. But what we've seen in the UK, but also in my home county, the Netherlands, uh, with materiality is quite interesting. So that's certainly something for follow-up. And that links also, I had a brief chat with Maureen earlier on, um, speaking last week on an academic conference, um, I pointed to the researchers that this is now a great opportunity for research, cross-border, global, internet, what, what's happening, how is it going, how can you re compare the reports, etc. I'm particularly pleased to see how you have linked it now with the communication with the audit committee. I think that's fully in line with appropriate corporate governance. Um, and it's a good starting point. And then also how you have linked that again with your documentation requirements. I think that is very helpful and responsive to concerns earlier expressed. 
Finally, I would say what is most important, and that's why it's good that Liz started, um, is that in particular users will give a lot of feedback on these new style audit reports. What we have seen in the UK with the investor awards issued by your organization, I think is very helpful. Now, in a way, the auditor is back in the public forum, so everybody can engage on this, and that's just encourage everybody uh, to participate in that. So, thank you very much. Thanks for those comments, Arnold. And uh, I think it goes back also a comment, Liz, I think you made about the, the fact that we did tie our requirements to critical audit matters are based upon or derived from matters that are communicated or required to be communicated to the audit committee. And I thought I heard you make a comment about that as well. If I'm wrong, I think you did. Um, we feel that's the right source, and certainly in the United States we feel it's the right source under the UN PCOB standards as our standard for audit committee communications is quite robust in terms of what is required by auditors to be communicated to audit committees. So we think that um, critical audit matters as we, as we envision them would certainly be within the content of what audit committees are required to hear from, from auditors. And I don't know if you were, you were expressing a concern about that scope or not in your comment. And whether or not, because it is quite a detailed list that you have in the, what is it, AS1301, um, whether or not that could actually result in a sort of shopping list approach um, to things that are disclosed. Um, and that, you know, that the, the really important thing is that the, it's the auditor's judgment, not, not their reporting lines internally to management, but it's the auditor's judgment on the matters that they think should be communicated to investors that's really important. Okay, we think that's there, but we would think that those, that those same judgments would apply, first of all, to their primary responsibility to report to the audit committee, those charged with governance about those significant matters that they addressed in the audit. So hopefully there's that same population there. And that's how we, we see that, but uh, thanks for that comment. Elizabeth Mooney. Okay, thanks. So I, I have five recommendations here, um, strong supporters of this, of this proposal. And um, the first is to get rid of the materiality threshold, just echoing Liz's comments. And we gave feedback on, um, on some of this over the, over the years. But in the terms of the new th materiality threshold, um, and also to, to, to get rid of that, and also to state, regardless of how subjective the matter is, that if an auditor feels that an issue is important to the audit, that, um, that and it's documented in the memo, that it be communicated to the audit committee as well as investors. Um, and number three, um, you know, disclose how materiality is assessed. Again, I, I, that, I mean, that just seems like that's just like a must with this project. Uh, we have given direct feedback to staff, like I said, over the years with my colleagues, um, and we um, have the CFA Institute commented, the, the IAG found overwhelming investor support for that. We have the experience in the UK, it is useful for gauging audit quality, for adjustments and restatements, so it's, it's, it's I, I don't see how that can't be part of the, this proposal. Um, Number four, disclose um, whether the audits limit uh, the ability uh, for the audit committee or investors to recover losses. So in the engagement contract, there are now alternative dispute resolution clauses being put in there, and investors really need to know if that's, if that's the case. It does impair independence by limiting their liability. And um, fifth, uh, require disclosure when in the audit report when the audit partner was rotated off before the mandatory rotation. So, I mean, it, it just in general, I think it's really important for this, for this proposal to be examined from the standpoint of looking at some of the, like the valiance, the lending clubs, the Chinese frauds, Chesapeake Energy, I mean, the list goes on and on of recent examples where investors weren't, saw nothing ahead. Um, and this, and see what, what would this audit reporting model have, have communicated? I mean, this is the communication piece with, the, with investors by the auditors. And the audit, they're really the, the real client, the real end customer of the audit report. We, we, 
are very interested in this communication and I think, it, I think it really reflects poorly on the profession to fight this transparency. So I just urge you to, um, to bring some of this to light uh, and in a conversation earlier than when the whistleblowers or the hedge funds you know, start surface things. So, and, it's a, and it's a big problem. And I think that get, these recommendations will help get us there. And Elizabeth, well, I, those are all interesting comments, which we'll certainly take into account, and uh, I assume you'll expand on those in a, in a written comment letter. Okay, thank you. Rick Murray. First, uh, my appreciation to the staff for the extraordinary amount of effort lying behind the preparation of the proposal and the quality of the materials uh, for the board meeting. Uh, question to help put this in the context of the, the regulatory objective here. Assume that the proposal were to be adopted as currently presented and we are next then in subsequent inspection cycles uh, under these terms. If the inspectors who would then have the advantage of subsequent event uh, insight were to determine that the, the best judgment had not been made with respect to what should have been identified as CAMs. But there is no evidence available to the inspectors to suggest that this was a bad faith judgment, even if severely mistaken. Would that be deemed for inspection purposes to be an audit deficiency? Uh, our inspectors uh, do not uh, try to second guess the judgments of, of the auditors. They look for reasoned judgments made by auditors at the time based on the facts that they had in any audit area and uh, evaluate the audits in that regard and not based upon hindsight uh, looking after the fact and what, they, what they've learned later. And, and, and not second guessing those judgments. So, uh, you know, it's, you've raised a hypothetical situation, and certainly don't, we don't have all the facts and circumstances. But just from a principle, on uh, a principled basis, um, we're looking for the auditors to communicate uh, in the requirements to the audit committee under the existing auditing communication standard to the audit committee, and to derive from those, as defined in the uh, new ARM proposal those matters that meet the definition of critical audit matters and disclose those and document those which they don't think met and um, based upon what they know at, at the time. So I don't, I don't think that uh, second guessing is, is an aspect of that. Marty, Marty the, uh, the proposal itself describes this as a principles-based uh, suggestion and, and it may be, um, although it is far more prescriptive and detailed than the comparable European-based initiatives that are laid alongside this. And it has, in, in reading it, so many layers of soft terminology and required judgments that lie behind it that I totally agree with and appreciate your, your reply that uh, it is not the regulatory purpose to criticize good faith judgments made in this process. Given the amount of prescriptive sensation that one gets in, in reading this, would it be appropriate and helpful if there were to be a statement in the nature, not necessarily a safe harbor, but the intention that you just described, Marty, of we aren't here to criticize good faith judgments, however uh, regrettable they may like it or be seen to be. Well, thanks for that comment, and we'll, we'll take that in con into consideration. But I think the point is, we, we agree with your point, that uh, uh, it's based upon the auditors uh, meeting the requirements, based upon the facts and circumstances at the time, and it is principles-based uh, standards. So, but, but we'll certainly take your comment into consideration, so thanks. Philip Johnson. 
Thank you. Uh, as you know, I'm a great advocate of, uh, of this. Um, and uh, my involvement goes back uh, five years. Um, and it was uh, when I was president of the Federation of European Accountants, uh, I was right in the middle of the debate with the European Commission with regard to the uh, green paper uh, looking at the auditing profession. And almost uh, to, the, uh, to the week, uh, five years ago, I gave a lecture in London, which uh, I entitled The Accounting Profession, Reinvent or Face to Extinction. And the reason for the title was partly to get people there to listen, because if it had been the future of assurance, I'm sure people wouldn't have turned up, very, uh, or many people would have turned up. But, but more importantly, what it was about, it was because the, during that debate in, in Europe, uh, um, it was felt by many uh, that the auditing profession was becoming irrelevant. The, and we'll have this debate later on uh, over the next few days with regard to uh, uh, some of the items on, uh, uh, on the agenda. Um, and what I'm pleased to see what happened was that the FRC in, in the UK did take up the initiative put down by the European Commission and then subsequently the European Commission have, have, uh, have brought it uh, into legislation. So we have, uh, uh, we've heard the UK has had it for three years. Uh, the EU, it is mandated from June, June 2016. The Netherlands have, uh, have brought it in. Uh, and so I, I do see this as, as a very positive move. And I congratulate the, uh, the PCOB because uh, I think through the exposure that, and the comments that have been made and taken on board, the, very, the really three key areas are the IWSB standard, FR, FRC, which is slightly different, including the in, in, uh, inclusion of materiality, and the PCOB have come much closer together. And I think that is, that is to be commended because uh, we're talking here about uh, uh, glo you know, the global economy uh, and reporting globally. And so the fewer uh, differences uh, the better. Uh, I think that what will happen in the future is that, uh, you know, Arnold mentioned uh, about the post-implementation review. Like I said, with regard to the audit signature, I don't think it finishes with, with having a standard. I think these things will evolve and I would hope that uh, matters will, uh, will get closer together. So I think we're, we're in a good place, much better place than probably 12 months or two years ago. So I think we're in a good place. Looking from, I was in the profession, I now chair audit committees. Uh, from the audit committee perspective, uh, it's been very, very interesting to see the uh, difference in engagement of audit committee members, the engagement of audit team members, because now uh, they are, there's a, there's a more, there seems to be a more common purpose audit committees are getting, definitely getting more engaged on what they have to report, particularly in the UK, uh, but also what the auditors are reporting. And, the, and it comes back to the pride in the work that was mentioned before, uh, that the audit teams are taking more pride because it's not just uh, a boilerplate report. Their work is being appreciated. So I think that is a, a, great, uh, a great move forward. Um, with regard to the laundry list and, and, and whether uh, auditors will disclose too much or too little, etc., etc., um, it, materiality has to come into this. What is important to the investor? Um, I sh shared uh, a platform with Olivia Kirtley, as you all know, is the IFAC president, but also uh, is chair of a number of audit committees in the US and we were talking in Paris last week and we were talking about uh, the relationship between audit committees uh, and auditors and, and how the role can be enhanced, uh, uh, the auditor's uh, role and, and the audit committee uh, role. Her view was, and I'm not speaking for her, this is 
uh, uh, a known uh, statement by, uh, by her that uh, uh, there is nothing that would be reported that she wouldn't have expected uh, over the years to have been discussed with, with audit committees. And so we're not in new territory. The only new territory really is, is an external uh, rather than internal focus. So therefore there's limited additional documentation and people have a worry about additional cost, etc. I don't see that. We've not seen that in the UK because all that work has already been done. Uh, so it, it's not a, a great issue. Um, I and we in, in the UK do have the advantage, as I've said before, of having one regulator for governance, for financial reporting, and for auditing. That's a great help uh, because the strategic report, the vi new viability statement that companies have to uh, uh, put out, and the audit committee report are mandated by the FRC on the company. So the story is already being told about the risks within the business. Uh, and the auditor report is just part of that development of, of better communication. So I think that we are, you know, five years ago, I, I talked about extinction with regard to the audit uh, profession. I think, it's turned, I think it's turned 180 degrees that now people see, particularly the investor community, see much more relevance to the committee, uh, to the uh, auditor uh, and, and the audit process. And so I just think this is an enormous leap forward, and I commend the, uh, the PCOB for making uh, these changes. Philip, thanks for those many comments. And, and I agree with you that uh, what's really <coughs> great to see, as Arnold pointed out, naming people around, uh, partners around the world who stated uh, their pride in their work and the importance of their work and providing more useful information to investors that the profession certainly in those markets where this is already uh, being required, a profession embracing the fact that they're adding increased value to investors through this expanded reporting. And um, it's great to hear, great to see, and uh, hopefully it will be equally embraced here in the United States. So thanks for all those good comments. So. John Lekomnik. Um, so I wanted to add to the chorus of investors who are thanking you. So consider, consider, consider um, the chorus filled out with one more voice to the staff and the PCOB for progressing this. Um, I do want to, however, revisit what Liz and Elizabeth said about materiality um, and, and address what you said about only getting one comment before. The 2013 release relied, as Liz said, on the professional judgment and of the auditor, as Arnold said, on the relevance judgment, which is why they did not require materiality to be disclosed. You have now made materiality a gating issue. Once you make it a gating issue, I think we deserve to know how wide the gate is. You can't, it, it seems that there's a, a linkage that you have put here that without knowing what the materiality is, it's, it's hard to judge. I also think, as Elizabeth said, well, it has, the other change since 2013 is we do have the UK experience. And taking away from the fact that it is a gating issue for the CAMs, CAM, um, and therefore, I do think you, there's an obligation. You, you, why would I comment on something that wasn't relevant to the proposal previously? It's now very relevant to what a CAM is. So it's not surprising that you wouldn't have gotten comments in 2013 about it. Um, however, I do think that the UK experience shows that there is value to disclosing the materiality standard irrespective of the linkage to CAMS. Indeed, I believe the very first investment bank report on the UK um, enhanced reporting model, which I believe was Citicorp, if it wasn't the first, it was the, one of the first, talked about how people were surprised by how large some of the materiality standards were. And it engendered a conversation in UK 
audit committees as to whether or not they had the right materiality standards. I think that is very much an audit quality issue. Um, and I, so I, I, I see no reason not to have it disclosed. And indeed, if you were going to make it a gating issue, I think this draft proposal increases the importance of having it disclosed. So it's come up a couple of times. So John, thanks for the comments, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly take them into account. Um, I do want to say there's a difference between the UK requirement for the auditor to disclose a number they have set for purposes of planning the audit uh, for scoping in terming what is material in the, in the planning of the audit and establishing their audit scope and doing work. That is different than when looking at a set of financial statements and based on quantitative, qualitative assessments, determining whether matters in the financial statements are material. There is a difference between those two. It's, it's, maybe it's a subtle statement I'm making, and I think some heads are nodding yes, and others maybe are looking at me questioningly. But um, one is a auditor scoping decision about what is materiality threshold for trying to set tolerable misstatement and determining the scope of work they'll perform. The other is looking at a set of financial statements and determining are the disclosures that are materially important there and made, do the financial statements all include all necessary disclosures, and then having critical audit matters pertain to matters in the financial statements mm -hmm. that are material, i.e. material to counts or, or disclosures. Um, so there are two different discussions almost taking place there, one about a scope threshold and one about t linking this matter to items in the financial statements that are potentially qualitatively or quantitatively material. Having said that, I understand the point that some of you are saying still the disclosure of the auditor's assessment of scoping level of materiality is important in your understanding of the audit, and that's a critical additional factor you'd like to see disclosed. But I do want to make the point that there is a distinction between what we're saying, what the auditor has to the test for a CAM versus this other point. And it's uh, so. Um, I, I accept that and generally the auditor's scoping materiality will be less than what is material in a financial statement. But it is a data point. It's a data point. The materiality for the auditor is a set in the beginning of the audit is a data point. I understand that and I understood the comment uh, made earlier from Liz that that's an important data point to see how the audit is viewing that audit when they set their scope and do their plan. What are they setting as the quantitative threshold for materiality, for scoping? And that doesn't take into, of course, it leaves out a big thing, though. What are many qualitative assessments and factors? And, and that can't be really disclosed by the auditor in, in, that, in that statement that, uh, you know, it's 2.5% it's of net income or something like that. The, the, the fact that you find out that the CFO can't use a calculator cannot be, quant cannot be put down in it's fact specific. I, I grant you. That doesn't, but I think that to argue that because you can't list all the qualitative factors, you shouldn't list the quant, you shouldn't disclose the quantitative ones, really is a, 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 a making best the enemy of better. So, yeah. at least from my point of view. Yeah, I didn't mean to argue the point. We've heard a couple of people say that you'd like to see materiality threshold the auditor sets disclosed, and that's a comment you have, and a number of you have made that, so uh, thanks for that. Um, Thank you, Peter. Yeah, can Brian, I, let me just, uh, Brian wanted to think, comment on this, if I can just go to Brian. It, thanks. Actually, Marty, thanks for the clarification. I was actually going to make some similar remarks and just thought it would be helpful to reinforce that I, I think it would be beneficial in the feedback to know what materiality one is looking for for the disclosure. Is it the same materiality management the auditor looks to in assessing financial statement materiality, which, by the way, is a legal framework today, uh, looking to the Supreme Court. Uh, that and, and nothing the FASB would do for public companies, by the way, if they were to do anything, would change that. That's that's set by 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 um, the commission. That's longstanding relative to what the commission looks to uh, in in thinking about materiality. And then the audit concepts that Marty's describing relative to materiality and planning materiality are a different concept for planning and performing the audit. 
uh, would be helpful to understand in any comments to the PCOB, I think, what what the ex exact uh, you know, recommendation would, would, would be and how it might relate to those, those concepts. Right. Uh, Sandy Peters. Yeah, I had raised my hand back when Liz was talking about materiality and was going to echo her comments, but since then I've, I've, I've felt the need to add to that. Um, you know, I think that we as an organization have asked investors, do they want materiality disclosed? And the answer is resoundingly yes. Um, but the conversation that's just happened here um, is one that by not disclosing materiality, you don't even know these distinctions. Investors don't know um, the subtleties of the distinction between planning and scoping and the financial statement and all of these nuances. Um, and that disclosing the materiality in, in either of these or of these several different ways facilitates that conversation. Our fundamental problem with the lack of disclosing materiality is that the judgment is being made by people who never talk to investors. So it's being made by auditors who rarely talk to investors, who don't know how they decide whether something's material. And certainly they can read reports of investors and um, in the company and get a view on consensus earnings, which are analyst earnings and, and the like. I'm not certain how much that's actually done, but for us it's really about facilitating a conversation with respect to um, do you really know what I as an investor think is material and oh, you have different views of materiality. We published a, 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 the results of our survey, which we had done several years ago. We extracted it out in, I don't know, January, December or January in, re, in, in response to the FASB's materiality proposal to highlight that we think this is fundamentally a communication issue and that investors don't see it the way that, um, that auditors <clears throat> necessarily do. And, you know, to our mind that the disclosure of it facilitates um, communication and, and an understanding about, in fact, how um, people are making that judgment. And, and so we can come to a common understanding. And I think, you know, Philip's point is a good one, that that communication um, <clears throat> and all of these various communications, to me, um, Liz's point is one of, well, you're communicating it to the audit committee, but the real issue is we want to hear directly from the auditor. And we understand that that may be exactly the same thing, and I understand that the auditing, but, but it's a fundamental shift in what investors, we're, we're hiring management, we're hiring the auditors, we're hiring the audit committee, we want to hear from everybody separately. Um, to see if it, you know, all hangs together, I think, is, is part of it. But I think, you know, Philip's point of increasing the communication it really does um, demonstrate to investors that there's relevance to the process. And I think shying away from making that communication is really detrimental to the profession because it's, we don't want to give you any information. And, and I think that that's the problem that investors have with the relevance of, of, of auditors right now. Thanks for that additional clarification and the importance of materiality and how you would use it. So, you know, understanding why it's important to investors is very important to us as we consider comments on the reproposal and where we move forward on this, uh, on this particular release. And certainly I'd be interested in hearing any other, you know, auditor reaction uh, or preparer reaction to your, to your comments and others' comments here about disclosure of materiality. Bob Hurst. Um, I've been a long time supporter of this, this project and a great admirer of what's, what's going on in the UK the last three years and their boldness in doing it and how it, I think it's really developed in a way that uh, does help all the parties involved. Uh, my, my specific comments, and I think I made them on the first proposal, was uh, I think around two related uh, points that uh, I think Liz made. What, one was uh, if I read this proposal, the description of the CAM, it's kind of optional to uh, include in that what the auditor found. I think it says you could do it, but if you do it, make sure you don't uh, give any impression that you're giving uh, in, uh, separate assurance on that particular matter, you know, separate audit opinion on that particular matter. And so, I don't know, it just seems to me, you know, in the, in the context of the discussion, 
you know, say, okay, this was the issue, this is uh, what you did, so, so what? Uh, the second around that uh, uh, point that Liz made is the point about kind of the color commentary and such things like, you know, management bias. I think, you know, as an audit committee member or chair, uh, on those kind of matters, you know, kind of key questions, you always, you, you ask those questions. Was there management bias? The way they went about that, uh, that, that estimate, is it consistent with how they've done it in, in prior periods? And I think that kind of color commentary, certainly from an audit committee point of view, is very important. I don't know whether, if, if I read the proposal, whether, okay, since I asked it as an audit committee chair and the auditor said to me, yeah, it's consistent and they're, you know, usually right in the middle of the fairway, whether that then would have to be, uh, since it was communicated to the audit committee, would then be, uh, you know, would be required in the description of the camp. It's more just a question. I would say my bias is an auto, <laughs> just because I think that's important information also to, you know, to the investors. Your bias was to what, Bob, at the end of uh, my, 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 my leanings are if it's important to the audit committee and a good, diligent audit committee, to, you know, who's asking those kind of questions and they're important from, you know, might be important to co compensation, the covenants, those kind of things, you know, they just kind of change it from here in the fairway to here in the fairway. Um, but those are important from an audit committee point of view, but it, it's a very, ch I could appreciate how reporting it publicly in our regime versus, you know, the Jimmy Dabu comment on the original Daimler audit, audit report of KPMG said, you know, we found this, this estimate mildly optimistic, which I'm sure was, you know, their way of signaling like, yeah, it was really at the fringe <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. Uh, yet. That kind of, kind of color commentary, clearly, what well, I say it's an audit committee is very important. I would imagine it's important to investors. I think that's what I heard Liz say. But I also recognize the challenges in our environment in, in being able to, to do that in, in a public report like that. So I don't have a solution, just, just you know, it, the goal would be to somehow be able to do that or at least encourage it. Those are all good comments, and um, uh, Jessica will comment in a minute. The, the proposal doesn't preclude the auditor from doing that, and you're precluded from giving a piecemeal opinion on the account or disclosure, or in your disclosure to give an inference that you're not giving assurance on the, on the matter. But otherwise, uh, there's a, some broader words in the release that maybe you can Summarize, Jessica. Um, so the release provides a, an, or the standard provides an ability or a requirement for the auditor to describe how the matter was addressed in the audit. And so the release goes on to say there are several ways that this could be done. And those would include uh, the auditor's response or approach that was most relevant to the matter, a brief overview of procedures performed, an indication of the outcome of the auditor's procedures, or key observations with respect to the matter. And um, the critical audit matters, the example that we put into the release has a description of how the auditor responded. So it would be, um, in our case, we put in some procedures. Our examples did not include that. However, the um, Proposal does not preclude the auditor from doing that. From making further observations. Yep. All right. Um, Philip Johnson, I know you wanted to respond. It's on this very point, and this is a big issue um, because it's the, the so what. Uh, and um, we do have to be very, very careful that we don't drive auditors to give a whole series of mini, mini opinions on, on items on, 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 on that balance sheet. Uh, because that is dangerous because the opinion is on the financial statements as a whole. Um, I know uh, KPMG did with the Rolls-Royce example as you, you've mentioned, talk, have findings. In the UK that's not been picked up as much as perhaps uh, we thought it might have been because auditors look to, for competitive advantage. 
Uh, and you know, the question was, well, if KPMG did that on, on uh, uh, Rolls-Royce, would others be doing it on, on other? Uh, and so you then get into uh, almost a feeding frenzy on trying to find uh, innovative ways of, of, of reporting. But that, I don't think that, that, that has happened. But it is something that I think uh, uh, we have to be mindful of. Uh, and if we give too much latitude, you could get a whole series of, uh, of many opinions, which is definitely not uh, the place we, uh, we want to be. Nor do we want the critical audit matter to not just have piecemeal opinions and a variety of many opinions, but we don't want it to undermine the overall opinion on the financial statements either. But uh, nonetheless, your comments are understood uh, and, and uh, taken into account. Sir David Tweedy. Thank you. Can I, can I say that uh, I'm really delighted that uh, we've got to this stage now. I, I think this is the most important project that uh, PCOB has probably ever done because most of the others that you've done are, if you like, dealing with the mechanics of the audit. This one is the visible end of the audit. And I, when you talk about the audit report being the same for 75 years, I mean, it's quite shocking, really. It stayed that way for, for so long. I'm delighted, too, that uh, you've been very much uh, aware of the international situation. I think it's very important we take the best of what's out there, and you're doing that. And uh, there's one or two issues I think possibly you want to investigate. I very much agree with Bob and Philip that the... Uh, so you looked at this area and what did you find? I thought the uh, KPMG report was terrific. Uh, and on balance, uh, it only dealt with about five or six issues. But what it did do, it gave you the impression that, yeah, okay, maybe they've overstated it slightly here or understated it there, but on balance, it's a fair presentation. And I thought that gave me great um, comfort in looking at that particular audit. You really got the feel of uh, what happened in there. I'm sorry you've had so much resistance to, to doing this. Uh, I remember when I first went to FASB before Bob was there, and uh, we're looking at the work program, and they had a pension standard, uh, and the timetable was eight years. And I remember saying that I was a student at university in 1961 when President Kennedy said he'd put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And I couldn't believe that was uh, less important or less complicated than a pension standard. Uh, ex experience proved me wrong as it turned out. You know, any fool a man in the moon but getting a pension standard out is something quite different. So I do understand why you've been held up, but I'm, I'm glad you're pressing ahead. I think the thing that I feel is so important is I think this is terrific for auditors. And, you know, I felt quite sorry for auditors in a way. The, the reason we're all here is because people didn't trust the audit. So they put an inspection mechanism in, uh, PCOB, which has been copied uh, around the world. And you know, why was it there? Was it just that you wanted to G them up? Uh, was it the fact that they were getting a bit lackadaisical? Or was it what probably did, people did think, they're too close to the client? And when you look at Europe, there we've had in the last few years the rotation issue. Now, why is that there? Well, is it because people think a fresh pair of eyes would be useful? Or is it the fact that... Uh, these guys are too close. And I suspect it was the latter. And that's just perception, which is harder to change than fact. And this, I think, is a great defense against it. Because when you're talking about, well, I'm sorry, this great auditor, which all the investors like, has got to change, you can see the resistance starting to come to that. And the danger is if this doesn't get underway and you have another Enron, well, why don't we start changing the auditors? Uh, and that's the sort of danger, I think. So I think this is a great defense for the auditor. I don't think this is the end of it. Because I think, uh, and you heard from uh, Liz and Elizabeth, the things that they want to see in the audit report, well, that isn't a bad idea. If the auditor starts moving more towards the investors and away from the company, I think that's great. And what do the auditors want to know? I was shocked in your papers uh, when you really started this project to read about the uh, audit report for a company that uh, received a lot of the TARP funding. And the audit report, if I remember rightly, in 2008 uh, cost, uh, well, the audit cost 119,000, and it was 193 in 2009, $74 million. And the audit report was word for word the same. This is going to be completely different. And I think that's why you want to know, well, so what? You've obviously had a problem, probably with the loan book in that case. And what did you find? So I think this is terrific. This is changing the dynamics of the audits. 
And I would press on in as quickly as you can, because I think this is something that is going to grow legs. And I would like to see the auditors and the investors getting closer and closer together. And there's another aspect of this too, which again is in the United Kingdom, the relationship to the auditor and the regulator. Uh, more on the prudential side than the securities regulators yet, but I don't know why it shouldn't be that way. But they can be the regulators said, we're concerned about X, make sure you have a good look at that. And that's the sort of thing that I can see. The auditor's role in society getting more and more important. And this is the key to it all. And I'm delighted that you've copied the uh, IWASB and the FRC in many aspects. More could be done, but uh, this is a great start. Well done. Well, well thanks for that. We, we are going to pursue ahead uh, very aggressively as we understand the importance of this to investors. And uh, so hopefully uh, you'll see a final product before you... Uh, fly on a plane that's on the balance sheet of the airline that, uh, that uh, you're flying on. So um, <coughs> yeah, that took 20 years, the leasing standard. <laughs> uh, uh, Steve Harris. Yes, sir, David, you mentioned Enron, uh, and there have been a number of scan accounting scandals, uh, Enron, WorldCom, Savings and Loan, 2007-2008. Uh, how would the audit reporting model and the CAMs and, and the key audit matters uh, that are currently being considered have impacted, if at all, uh, investor perceptions? I think the, the aspect of it is when you look at an audit, uh, let's take, I think it was the Ernst Young one when they were dealing with, uh, it was a BP, and one of the key issues was the relationship with the Russian joint ventures, and that was something I think a lot of people were concerned about. So you know that the auditor is going in there. Now, are you happy with what he says he's done or what he's doing? And I think that's the sort of thing, Steve, that can, can help. You know, the auditor is, this is an area that the investor is concerned about or the regulator is concerned about. He's gone in, he's done this, what's he found? And do you think he's done enough? And then that's an issue that can be taken up with the auditor afterwards. I think it raises the level of the audit. It won't stop the crooks or the guys who try and mislead things, but uh, it's, it's a great help. Tom Selling. Uh, like like uh, numerous others before me, um, I just want to start by saying that I think the proposal is a great start, that it will provide real information to the users through the audit report, and if the standard is finalized, it will constitute a significant achievement by the board. I have two comments uh, that are related, um, and this um, actually follows up a little bit on, on, on Steve's question. Uh, the first one is that I believe an area of CAMs that merits special attention in the standard is the selection of accounting treatments from non-authoritative GAAP. My concern is partly in regard to the advent of the FASB GAAP codification, which was a very good thing, uh, but it changed the protocol that was formerly in auditing standards and that now is in the codification regarding the selection of accounting treatments from non-authoritative GAAP. For example, it's more likely now that a selection of non-authoritative GAAP might not be consistent with statements of financial accounting concepts because the concept statements no longer have a special status within that protocol. It would seem to me maybe that there should be special consideration of this uh, in the auditing standard, uh, perhaps an illustrative example of when selection of non-authoritative GAAP becomes a CAM, how it should be discussed, and especially when there's a conflict between the accounting treatment and, and general concepts. Uh, my second point is, my second comment, is that I understand why, but nonetheless hoped uh, that the changes made would be more comprehensive regarding other aspects of the auditor's report. I have in mind by this the fact that the board uh, chose not to reconsider the language in the opinion paragraph even though it needs to be clarified or preferably significantly revised. Uh, I know I have limited time, but just, let me just talk about five brief situations. Currently, situation one, currently the PCAOB says that the audit report, and I paraphrase, is, uh, makes, is, opines that the financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with GAAP. Example number one. Example number two is that at times in the past, some auditors used a different phrase. It was presented fairly and in accordance with GAAP. Steve, Rice, Steve Zeff of Rice reports that 70 years ago, the leadership of Arthur Anderson decided that the firm had to be straight shooters, that financial statements did not necessarily present fairly 
when they used accounting principles that were, in his judgment, not appropriate, even if they were generally accepted. Example number three. Currently, CEO CFO certifications called for by SOX and SEC rules state that the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects without a reference to GAAP. Example number four, the AICPA standards on other comprehensive bases of accounting could state, and I paraphrase, that the financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with the modified cash basis of accounting or insert pretty much any other so-called comprehensive basis, even if that basis is issued, is, is designed by the user itself. My fifth example, no competent economist would assert that financial data not adjusted for inflation could ever constitute a fair presentation of the data. Yet, no matter how much inflation distorts financial statements, they are, according to the auditor's report, always somehow fairly presented. So what does fairly presented in accordance with GAAP mean, even as a turn of art? I know that the PCOB has Section 411 to explain fairly presented, but with all due respect, it sheds virtually no light on the investor communications issue that I'm concerned with. When speaking to investors, all the words used in the auditor's report should mean something. In all other respects, the PCAOB has done a commendable job in specifying requirements for an informative audit report capable of being expressed in standard English. Yet, in the key opinion paragraph, arguably the bottom line of the auditor's report, critical terms lack literal meaning and effectively construct a facade of gravitas uh, that is inconsistent with protecting the public interest. So, uh, in conclusion, I, I very much condemn, I'm very much commend, I almost said condemn, I very much commend the PCOB for the progress it's made, uh, but uh, I see it as incremental but important progress, but in a, uh, this is an area that I really feel strongly about, and I hope the, the board is going to revisit it sometime. Thank you. Chuck Senator? Look, I, I see a number of 10 cards, and I know we're at lunch coming up, so let me just sort of boil this down. Um, one of the things that Elizabeth said sort of struck me when she talked about, in essence, I guess her second point was if an auditor thinks something's important, let them talk about it. Um, my quick suggestion, this is really on the margin, Marty, and this, this, this is really something that I'm maybe very, very subtle. But sometimes rules have unintended consequences. Uh, and certainly a rule that could end up um, having an unintended consequence where at least you may be hearing some feedback about the possibility of self-censoring because of a certain standard and rule would not be a good thing. Um, I'm, not I'm not suggesting you haven't thought about it, and I think this is a great idea. But the only observation I would share with you is that, uh, and certainly this is probably a little bit more of a uh, stark example, is um, many times, you know, to the extent, the, the, the more rules people are asked to follow, they tend to, they tend to actually flip their behavior to the rule. And the best example from my world in terms of financial services, the broker-dealer regulations, you have a code of Hammurabi of rules that if people are footing to the rules, yet the outcomes aren't what they want. In fact, you're seeing now a kind of a reversion to a notion of best practice and best interest of the investor. So net net, my only point is, and sort of thinking about the feedback, and maybe just the twist and wrinkle, to the extent that you find that there might be this unintended consequence of a self-censoring because of a gating factor, just to think carefully about it because you wouldn't want to frustrate the, um, the spirit of what an auditor could be doing in terms of the value that could be added by virtue of this opportunity with respect to this release. Well, a lot of people, a number have made that point, and I appreciate you uh, echoing it and putting an exclamation point on it, and it is certainly a lot of something we think about a lot, or we thought about a lot in connection with the reproposal, uh, uh, the, the concept that uh, because you're required to communicate something with that shill, the communications to the audit committee such that you'd avoid you know, ultimately having to report it as a critical audit matter and all of that. So um, something we do think about a lot and we'll continue to think about those comments about self-censoring and make sure that uh, we do achieve the goals that we intend to as part of this uh, ultimately adoption when we get to that point. Thanks. Zach Alexiuk. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll be brief um, given time. Uh, and I, and I um, first would point, we, we submitted a comment letter in 2013 on this, um, and I won't reiterate all the points here, but um, in, in particular I would highlight, um, um, well, first of all, 
we are very supportive of this initiative. Um, we do believe, and I believe personally, that the reporting of critical audit matters will indeed be helpful for investors to better understand the financial statements. Um, and, and this is a meaningful evolution of the audit reporting model in this market. Um, that said, um, I hope that the, the board and, 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 um, and auditors will be mindful of um, ensuring that um, the, uh, the um, discussion of how the CAMs are addressed provides meaningful yet uh, not overwhelming information to investors. I would, I would highlight a risk of potential uh, boilerplate. We would imagine that there will be companies that will have recurring CAMs year over year, and so the audit uh, report may actually begin to look very similar year over year over time. Um, and so thinking about ways to keep the report fresh. But in particular, I want to I want to highlight my support um, incremental to this discussion here for the uh, change in scope of the definition of CAM to um, be narrowly focused on those issues that are um, um, communicated to the audit committee. Because um, to answer, I think, one of the questions that Bob made about so what, uh, as an investor, our, our first point of contact will be the CFO's office if we've got a question about the financial statements. But our escalation point and our, um, and, and I think our likely end point in uh, discussion of financial statements will be the audit committee. I don't envision um, investors having meaningful engagement directly with auditors about any specific issuer. So I think that narrowing that definition is, is very, very helpful for investors. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy Parler. Thanks. Let me uh, let me also say I'm a big fan of this, and just as a bit of a um, tangible feedback, I, I work every day. I speak with uh, large investors every day, and on uh, in showing them some of the uh, some of what's been coming out of the UK and these the cams over there, uh, it's been uh, a really positive experience for them. They wouldn't in their due course read through uh, the entire filing, uh, but when, when, when it was revealed to them, uh, there was definite incremental information to how they think about uh, uh, the risks involved uh, or not involved with the company. Um, uh, and I think that goes to uh, Sir David's point about bringing the auditor closer to investors. I think, I think this is an uh, important topic. Uh, let, me, let me just touch um, uh, briefly on materiality again. Uh, and I, I, I kind of, I, I think of the, the challenge a little bit differently, and may, maybe I'm thinking of it inappropriately. Uh, but I understand the concept of materiality of a finite amount, or the difference between two finite amounts, uh, when thinking about the scope of an audit, uh, where, uh, where the challenge in applying materiality to the CAMs arises, is these are. Uh, by definition, the most uh, complex and uh, subjective judgments uh, uh, in, in, in going through the audit. So how do you assess whether a complex judgment or uh, w whether an issue that you have is material? Uh, do you look at the, range, the entire spectrum of potential outcomes? Do you do uh, you know, several standard deviations away? Uh, if, for example, if there's a question about applying a particular revenue recognition policy, and that's a, 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 a complex issue, and uh, there are several different approaches that you could take, is is uh, uh, do you have to recalculate each? Do you think about uh, the most ag uh, aggressive versus the most conservative way uh, in assessing the materiality? And, and that challenge, uh, I think, presents itself if you make materiality a gaining factor, and it makes speaking to uh, something like relevance, does the auditor think this relevance much more, uh, much easier to do and uh, much more relevant. Thanks, Jeremy. Philip Santarelli. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll somewhat timidly wade into this materiality uh, concept. Um, from the auditor's viewpoint, at least one auditor's viewpoint. I think materiality is a data point. I don't think it's necessarily a high-quality data point. Um, 
I think the process that an auditor does, um, uh, as you noted, uh, uh, Marty, uh, for planning materiality, that is a number. It's generally a, a, a calculation. It's a benchmark. There's various methodologies that firms would use to come up with that first number. But that's all that it is. It's the first number. And, and in point of fact, uh, auditors, uh, good auditors, will, will go through the financial statements for individual accounts, transactions, et cetera, and frankly recalibrate the, the, the materiality at somewhat much lower levels, including zero materiality in particular transactions, and uh, which comes into the judgments that come around and the qualitative element. Uh, I don't I don't know how we can effectively uh, communicate all of that thought process in an auditor's report uh, without, in fact, in many ways, perhaps losing the audience uh, of what we're trying to communicate. And, and, I, and I softly reject the concept, the statements that have been made, that lower scope or lower materiality equals a quality audit. I, I don't believe that. I think through the process of evaluating audit quality indicators, there's been no empirical evidence that, in fact, that more hours, which is a, you know, which is a surrogate or a proxy for that, in fact, equals a quality audit. I think better quality hours e equals a quality audit, but uh, taking the material materiality down to zero, I don't think necessarily improves the audit process that much. So I caution. I caution all that, that think that materiality is, is a, a really good data point. Uh, I'm not so sure without empirical evidence that it is. So. so thanks for adding to that dialogue, that uh, alternative point of view. Sri Ramamorty. In the interest of full disclosure, I should say that this materiality thing is so close to me because I wrote my PhD dissertation on the topic of the psychology of auditors' maternity judgments. So I've been thinking about this for the longest time, and all I can say to all of you is, it's the heart and soul of auditing. It is equivalent of the statistical significance levels that statisticians use to make their judgments about what's important, what's significant, you know, that kind of thing, same, same kind of idea. But it is so complex that we go all the way from planning materiality to evaluate materiality to quantitative materiality to qualitative materiality to bandwidth materiality to fidelity materiality. You can keep on going. I mean, this, this is extremely complex. And so any time you make a disclosure, and that too of a partial truth, which is this quantitative portion, I think you are likely to confuse the reader because they will not understand the complexity that is inherent. And in the interest of lunch, I'm going to stop there <laughs> and leave you all hungry for more. Okay. Just, just send around your thesis to all of us in due course, and we'll, uh, we'll look at that. Thank you. Ken Goldman? Well, now I'm really feel at risk here with lunch and everything else after that comment. Um, <laughs> I don't have some, some of the perspective that many in this room do, <clears throat> but, I, but I do have a perspective of a CFO and watch this for many, many years. Um, and so I'll start with, since we just covered the materiality, uh, that's a hard one. Um, I see it over and over. It, it can change during the year, given where the company is and its earnings and change in earnings. It can, it can be different from the income statement versus the balance sheet. Uh, I, I don't know how you could possibly put enough words so the, the investor could understand what it really means. And so I, I am totally, personally totally against putting that in the report. Um, I think it's one of these things where we're trying to boil the ocean here, uh, which comes to my next point on critical audit matters and so forth. I was thinking about a good example. And to me, one exa a simple example might be you, you refer to see the material weakness on internal controls relative to XYZ. It's in the report on page XYZ. It's, it's factual. It gets the reader to focus on that without putting an, a qualitative assessment as to, you know, is it, how, how does the auditor feel or not feel about the weakness or whatever. 
I think the more you try to put qualitative, the more we're going to be in this room for 10 years arguing about this, uh, which is the same thing we had arguing about putting a name of the auditor engagement partner on. I think the more you make it factual, uh, practical, and get, get these things done, you get things done as opposed to trying to, what I say, boil the ocean, get everything in there, all the what's and what's, all the what's and ifs and so forth, which just makes it very complicated. But I think if you can put enough to, to show the reader, focus on these four or five items, here's where you can find more about it, that will get a lot accomplished and it would be a good step. Thank you. Um, Liz Morrow? I'll try and be quick. Um, Neither the UK or the PCOB have required the auditor to conclude on their findings when they're looking at, at critical audit areas. Um, we've seen in the UK in the first year we had the new audit report, there were three audit reports that had reported on the findings, the Jimmy Deboe audits which we've heard about, but it's gone wider than that. The market has responded to investor demand and we saw many more firms in the second year of these audit reports. Uh, Deloitte included some conclusions on their findings. Uh, PDWC did, although it was rather embedded in the work that they'd undertaken. And KPMG uh, reported their findings on nine audit reports. Um, I think interestingly from KPMG, we understand that they wrote to all their main audit clients. And there was pressure actually from the management of those audit clients not to take that extra step. I think from an investor perspective, that gives us rise for concern. Um, we don't view the findings as a separate audit opinion, but the auditor does a lot of valuable work for investors and reports the report to the members, the investors, and only the auditor can really conclude on the measures that they take. Um, but I don't think it undermines the audit report and you know, the true and fair view of itself. And as regards the reporting of materiality, we have reports from the AQRT, um, the review team in the UK from the FRC, and that with the increased tendering, they actually produced a report about three or four years ago now, that showed with increased tendering in response to market pressure, that audit fees were being driven down and materiality up. That was a concern. So by disclosing materiality, it helps address that. And yes, the probably investors don't fully understand what it, what, it, what it all means, but only if you disclose it does it give them a hook on which they can ask the questions and gain that understanding. Thank you. Thanks, and it looks like, Philip, uh, you have the uh, lunches waiting on the, got, your I've comments. Got, I've got the lunches waiting spot. <laughs> um, it's, it's in regard to this, there's been a lot of debate about materiality. And I know in the UK, and we just heard Liz talk about materiality, and I do understand this issue with regard to tendering and driving uh, audit fees. That, that's a totally different debate, uh, and, and I don't intend to get into that. But from my perspective as an audit committee chair, I actually don't see materiality being disclosed as... Uh, uh, having much relevance. Uh, I mentioned uh, in my last intervention when I was talking about the audit committee report. Uh, the audit committee report that, that we've produced, you know, it, it basically says what did we spend our time on as an audit committee? What was our engagement with internal audit as well as external audit? What was uh, our assessment of the effectiveness of the audit process uh, and, and the auditor? Uh, but importantly, it's where, what were the major judgments that we looked at in relation to the, uh, to the financial statements. And I think that's particularly important in this context. And you would expect that there would be some similarity between the audit in that context, the audit committee report, uh, and the auditor's report when you're talking about what were the major judgments that were in there. And so if we as an audit committee are saying what the, the major judgments were and, and what we did about them, we would expect the auditor to have a similar view uh, and therefore report on what they did to, uh, to satisfy themselves that uh, those judgments were appropriate. The audit committee, my audit committee, did not for one moment consider materiality they were looking at what were the key judgments. And I'm quite certain 
that the scope of the audit was determined through materiality by the auditors. But I don't think that, that that assessment of what they would report on came into the equation when they were uh, making that report. I, I don't think materiality actually was particularly relevant in the reporting process. It's re relevant with regard to the scoping, uh, but it's getting re less relative now, relevant now because with data analytics, which we'll probably talk about later this afternoon, uh, you know, they're using uh, materiality less in, in, in assessing their scope. So I don't think materiality really comes into this. It might be a number that investment, uh, investors would like to know, but I don't think it's relevant in relation to, uh, to reporting. Right. You, you added to that distinction that I pointed out before between scoping materiality and assessing materiality as part of the financial statements. Well, thanks for the very uh, lively and robust discussion of uh, not only the audit reporting model, but the other standard setting matters that, that I discussed earlier and the many items that uh, Jim discussed earlier this morning. So a uh, very lively discussion. We appreciate all the input. Um, we heard a lot of support for the, uh, the reproposal here and uh, from those who spoke at least and uh, a lot of other comments for us to take into account. With that, thanks very much, uh, Jennifer and Jessica as well, for the presentation and for all the SAG members for the input. And lunchtime. Okay, so lunch is going to be in the lobby, so you can back through the little passageway. Um, and then we are going to be restarting at um, 1.30 is what's on our schedule. So we'll restart at 1.30.